Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shremati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Paschachandi Satarine Vancha kalpa tarubhyas cha kripa sindhu bhaye vacha padita nam pavane bhyo vaishnavi bhyo Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Is that the chandelier for the temple room? Is that light? They're going to get bigger ones. Going to get bigger ones. All right, so we're reading Nectar of Instruction today again, continue. We didn't get very far yesterday. We just read a little bit from the preface. Do you remember anything? What did Prabhupada say in the pre preface? Something? We are all followers of Rupa Goswami. Right, we're followers of Rupa This movement is under the direction of Rupa Goswami. Yeah, Rupa Rupa. good. This movement is under the direction of Srila Rupa Goswami, right. Anything else? Right. Rupa Raghunatha Pahabe Pahibe Akuti Kabehama Bujala Se Meaning When will I able to When we are eager to take a mercy of the Right, what does it? Let's read it down. When I am eager to understand the literature given by the Goswamis, eager to understand, then I shall be able to understand the transcendental loving affairs of Radha and Krishna. So Srila Rupa Goswami was the leader of the Goswamis and to guide our motives, he gave us this Upadesh Amrita, the nectar of instruction to follow. As Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left behind him the eight verses known as Shikshastikam, Rupa Goswami gave us Upadesh Amrita so, so that we may become pure Vaishnavas. Hmm? So, Prabhupada understands we're not pure Vaishnavas, we have to become pure Vaishnavas, right? By following this Upadesh Amrita. Mm -hmm. In all spiritual affairs, one's first duty is, one's first duty in all spiritual affairs would be what? Control. Mind and senses, right? Control of the mind and senses. The first business in all spiritual affairs. So, you know, it's a challenge to control. Them. Unless one controls the mind and senses, one cannot make any advancement in spiritual life. Everyone within the material world is engrossed in the modes of passion and ignorance. One must promote himself to the platform of goodness, uh, sattva gun, by following the instructions of Rupa Goswami. And then everything can, con concerning how to make further progress will be revealed. So, Bhagavad Gita also instructs similar manner. You'll see, for example, 15th chapter, Bhagavad Gita describes the banyan tree. The upper regions of the banyan tree are the mode of goodness. And the lower regions of the banyan tree, the modes of passion and ignorance, darkness. 
And then 16th chapter describes divine and demoniac nature. The divine nature, the mode of goodness. The demoniac nature, passion and ignorance. Chapter 14, Bhagavad Gita, the three modes of material nature. Chapter 14 also, the mode of goodness is stressed over the fire of so much more important than the mode of passion and ignorance. Of course, people today, they give a lot of importance to passion. Passion, you know, they go, oh, passion. You know, they, they feel, oh, exciting, something exciting, something pleasurable. They don't know from the Bhagavad Gita, the result of action in the mode of passion is the distress, distress. The result of action in the mode of passion is distress. Go ahead, try it. <laughs> You'll soon realize it's true. The more you're involved in passionate activities, distress will come very quickly, very easily. You experience. People, you see people with very passionate people. Mr. Putin, for example, Putin, the leader of the Kremlin in Russia. Very passionate man, you see. And he's, in his passion, he sent his army into Ukraine, you know, to fight the Ukraine. They thought it would be so easy. He thought it would be so quick and easy, they will conquer you. They're still fighting. Such a long time. It's cost them so much money and so many lives and so much suffering. And Putin's frustrated, you know, pleading with his army leaders, why are you not defeating them? Why haven't you won the war yet? And even people are committing suicide. They're so frustrated trying to win their war. So that's the passion. Arjuna is not that kind of passionate person. And you, you see Arjuna thinking carefully before making decisions. Passion, they don't think about it. They just go ahead and do it. They say if it feels good, do it. <laughs> they don't realize it feels good in the beginning. That's the nature of happiness in the mode of passion. Feels good in the beginning, but what happens? Very quickly, it becomes poison. Happiness in the mode of passion. And happiness in the mode of goodness, in the beginning, it's like poison. Oh, control your senses. Oh, wake up early in the morning. Oh, take a bath. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, these things are like poison for materialistic people. Mm. But gradually becomes nectar. So a big difference. Happiness and passion and ignorance. The problem with passion is it easily degrades to ignorance. Easily degrades into ignorance. And then when you want to transcend, if you're trying to transcend from the mode of passion, then it's way up. And if you're in, down in the mode of ignorance, then it's a long way up. But if you're in the mode of goodness, then to transcend, it's, it's just a little bit, a little bit up, a little steep. So it's very advantageous for us to cultivate the mode of goodness. And we should always be thinking how to make our life more in the mode of goodness. How to simplify our life. We try to keep ourselves in the mode of goodness. Just like our, our dress, the dhoti and kurta, it's a mode of goodness. It's very different from jeans or a suit. You know? Shirt and pants, you know, 
the dhoti and kurta is very conducive for the motor. You can sit on the floor, we can sit cross leg. People come in their suits that they can't, can't do it. You know? And they can't wash their outfits so easily either. Very easily we wash the cloth and hang it up to dry. <laughs> but the suits and so on you have to put into dry cleaners. It's a very different affair. So our clothing, our hairstyle, <laughs> very simple. We just shave the head, don't keep much hair. Hair short. Mm. We try to cultivate the mode of goodness, of course, our food, the diet, the mode of goodness. Food shouldn't be too hot and too spicy. It should be, it should be nourishing, satisfying. It should be, uh, it should increase the duration of life. Some of the foods which people eat, uh, they just reduce the duration of life. They eat some of the most horrible things and they don't realize how, they're, how quickly they're re reducing their duration of life. So we try, then also our living style, devotees living in their home. You don't want to accumulate you don't want to over accumulate so many things. You want to try to minimize, try to live simply. Kavichandra Swami, he used to, he would tell me an acronym. You know what an acronym is? Hmm? You know, like ISKCON is an acronym for is International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So he said he said, there's a KISS principle. I said, what? He said, the KISS principle. I said, what's that? He said, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> oh. <laughs> something new, you learned something new. <laughs> keep it simple, stupid, the KISS principle. Right? So we try to keep everything simple, keep it basic. Don't get it too complicated. Mm. The mode of goodness is, it, it's very conducive to self-realization. It's also possible that you can take up self-realization in the mode of passion and in the mode of ignorance. But it's much harder work to transcend. If you can come to the mode of goodness, then it's much easier to transcend. Right? I was explaining, if we're already up there in the mode of goodness, it's only a little way up to pure goodness. But if you're in the mode of passion or ignorance, you're way down there. You have a long way up. So, Srimad Bhagavatam says, he talks about, thus established in the mode of goodness, the man rejuvenated by devotional service gains liberation from material association and comes to know scientifically the self. So definitely we are encouraged to be a, become established in the mode of goodness. And we want to be very much in the mode of goodness. I mean like if you're a pujari working with the deities, you definitely want to be in the mode of goodness. <coughs> You don't want to be too passionate or ignorant, but it is possible. You do get people, some pujaris are passionate people and lazy people, dirty. But the best pujari is the one in the mode of goodness. And similarly, sankirtan, book distribution. You want to do these that kind of things, preaching and so on. It's much better to be in the mode of goodness than to be in the mode of passion and ignorance. Because people can pick up on it. If you're in the passionate mode, you know, you're trying to get, give more, you know, they give you, give more, come on, give that big one, you know. <laughs> give the 2,000, why are you giving me the 500, you know. Yeah, they'll think, oh, this, this man's really, 
he is greedy, you know. <laughs> mm. So, we want to try to be in the more goodness, cultivate the more goodness. Then people can appreciate purity. Purity is a force. Passion is not a force. Purity is a force. Right? Mm. So we want to we do want to appreciate the mode of goodness and we want to try to cultivate that mode of goodness, constantly be examining ourselves, how much we're cultivating the mode of goodness, taking shower two, three times a day, like that, you know. Then people can that that will help us to come up to the mode of goodness. Prabhupada continues, he said, advancement in Krishna consciousness depends on the attitude of the follower. The attitude. Very important statement. Advancement in Krishna consciousness depends on the attitude. What is our attitude? Do we have the right attitude? in doing our service to Krishna. So, somebody, what someone's, at, someone's attitude, you know, that somebody wants money for their own pocket. Somebody else wants position, they want fame. Somebody else wants, we not, people, everyone has their different goals, desires. <laughs> why they're engaging in devotional service. And so the pure devotee wants to please Krishna. Somebody wants to do service for the guru. Somebody else wants to get recognition. They talk about lab, puja and pratishta. Right? These are not very good things to want. But of course, people have these desires. They want profit, adoration, distinction. But somebody else simply wants pure devotion to Krishna. So it all depends on our attitude. What is our attitude? Someone else, someone may have the attitude, oh, they couldn't care less. They just couldn't care less. They don't have a, a very uh, good motivation towards Krishna. I'm coming to Mangalarti. Just give me time. You know, they're at it. When they come in, you know, Arti's already maybe halfway through. They're just finishing offering the ghee lab. I came to Mangalarti. You know. some, some people make it to the Nishringa prayers. I came to Mangalarti. They came at Nishringa prayers, yeah. So they, they have a different, people have different attitudes. Attitudes should be favorable for cultivating Krishna consciousness. You have to have the right attitude. Did any of you ever serve in the army? Were you ever in the military? None of you, eh? No. Uh, People told me in the military what they do is when you join the military, they train the soldiers, they train them just to be obedient, just to do what they're told. That's the, the most important principle in military training. The officer says run, everybody runs. Officer says stop, stop. Like, you have, they're, just, they're just trained to be obedient, just do what you're told, without question, right? And so, their attitude is like obedience. In Bhakti Vidya Swami Maharaji's uh, traditional Gurukula there in Mayapur, the Gurukula in Mayapur, the children there are given education. But the education is not so much in the three R's. You know the three R's? The three R's? Reading, 
writing and arithmetic. We say the three R's. Reading, writing, arithmetic. <laughs> they don't get so much training. That's not so important. They get a little basic of things. But the real training for the children in the Gurukula are cleanliness. To be clean and punctual and to be very... Uh, uh, to be shastri, to be a, a humble and obedient. So the children, the, the boys in the Gurukula there, they get that training, they worship, because they're worship, they, all the things they do like worship the deity and chant mantras all day and uh, they also do their own cooking. They don't hire people to cook for them. The boys do their own cooking. They cook for, you know, they, they are, they're trained and they cook. So that's their attitude, they're, at, they're training their attitude so that they'll be very clean about everything. Keep everything very nice and neat and clean and simple. They sleep on the floor. No, put a mat on the floor, sleep on the mat. They don't sleep in the daytime, they only sleep in the night. No sleeping in the day. That's also considered very good. So they get that, they get that kind of training. And that training is very helpful for them because they're training these children that they will go into Krishna conscious centers and they will take up some service. They'll be engaged as pujaris, or they'll be in, some of. The, there had there was one boy. He was from Spain, I think, and uh, he'd been in the Guruko, He learned everything: expert kirtanir, madanga playing, could do all the yagyas, chant all the mantras, knew all the deity worship. So he went to Spain. They made him the temple president because he was a he knew everything, you know. He'd been in the Gurukula for years, he'd learned every, and he was good, you know, great kirtanir, and could give good classes, knew all the slokas. So, these kind of children, they can do that. Other boys, they'll go into the TOVP. When we open the temple of the Vedic planetarium, the big temple, they will be able to go in there and be the, some will be the pujaris and some will be the cooks and so on because they're trained they've been living in Mayapur, they've been studying in Mayapur and they know, they know everything and so the, it's very suitable for them to go into the temples and become devote, full-time devotees they won't, won't even think about it because they're They've been brought up in Mayapur and they've been de devotees, you know, so difficult for them to leave and go back to normal life. Sometimes they do, but very rare. Usually once they get a taste for Krishna consciousness, they never want to leave it, don't want to go back. So that's the idea develop that attitude, the right attitude, favorable to Krishna. Prabhupada continues, he said, a follower of the Krishna consciousness movement should become a perfect Goswami. Right? Goswami. A perfect Goswami. Mm -mm. I was just listening today about one, one devotee, uh, he's doing a, a study, probably the 26 qualities of a devotee. And he's taking each, each day, he takes one quality of the 26 qualities. And then he interviews different Prabhupada disciples who had some association with Prabhupada. And he gets them to give their realization or their comments about Prabhupada and how he had these uh, qualities. So I was just listening this morning, one devotee, they were talking about the quality of 
being a perfect gentleman. Here they say a perfect Goswami. But the quality, one of the 26 qualities, is that one who is a devotee, he will be a perfect gentleman. So the, the one devotee was speaking, he was describing how Prabhupada met his sister, Prabhupada's sister Pishima. She was also a devotee, she was younger than Prabhupada, but they were quite close in age. Prabhupada said, we often used to fight together. Prabhupada said, I used to beat her. <laughs> If you have a sister, maybe you have that experience, you know. And if you have a sister, you beat. <laughs> no? Anyway, uh, Prabhupada said like that. So Pishama, she was a, she was being, she'd been initiated by one of Prabhupada's god brothers. And she would often come, when Prabhupada was in Mayapur, she would come. She was a very nice old lady. Just spoke Bengali, never spoke English. And everywhere she'd go, she had a little bottle of Ganga water and she would spray Ganga jal everywhere, you know. After sitting somewhere, before touching anything, just bring out a bottle of Ganga jal, spray the Ganga water everywhere. <laughs> that was her habit. So anyway, uh, she had come to see Prabhupada, so the devotee was serving Prabhupada and he said, Prabhupada, your sister's here, she would like to see you. So Prabhupada said, okay, bring her in. So he brought her in. And then the devotee was serving Prabhupada. He thought, he said, I've got some things to do, I'll go away. And Prabhupada said, no, no, you stay here. Don't go, sit down. And so he had to sit there and Prabhupada was talking to his sister in Bengali. And they were sp speaking for about half an hour. The devotee was sitting there, you know. He, <laughs> couldn't understand Bengali, of course, he, but he had to sit there. And so afterward, Pishima got up and left. And then Prabhupada told the devotee, you stay here. And then Prabhupada said to the devotee, he said, you should understand. He said, I am sannyasi. I cannot be alone with a woman. So the devotee understood Prabhupada, you know, he's over 70 years old and his sister's also similar age. But Prabhupada, and it's his sister, but Prabhupada saying, as a sannyasi, I cannot be alone with a woman. That's why I didn't want you to go. That's why I told you to stay. So Prabhupada was following the principle so strictly because the principle of a Goswami or, or a Swami, they cannot be alone with a woman. And how carefully Prabhupada followed that principle, you see? So that was the example I heard this morning. And, and so Prabhupada said, we have to become a perfect Goswami, right? I was talking yesterday, Prabhupada told those two sannyasis that you want to understand what it means to be a Goswami? Study the Goswami Astikam. Nidrahara vihara kadi vijito chaitanya dino chayo. Right? You know that? Goswami Astikam. Nidrahara. They conquered over eating and sleeping. They were always meek and humble. They accepted loincloths and lived like mendicants. But they were always in the ocean of love of God, in the mood of the gopis. Right? What was the mood of the gopis? Service in separation. Service in separation. Vipralamba Seva. So this is the Goswami's... Uh, then Prabhupada continued, Vaishnavas are presently known as Goswamis. In Vrindavan, this is the title by which the director of each temple is known. One who wants to become a perfect devotee of Krishna must become a Goswami. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, is he a Goswami? Huh? Which Goswami is he? 
Seventh Goswami, right. Bhakti, you know, one, one man praised him like that, one very respected scholarly person, knew Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he studied him, he said, you are the seventh Goswami, right. He was really Goswami, because Goswami means given up all attachments, not attached to anything material. So that is Goswami. Uh, Go means the senses and Swami means the master. Unless one controls the senses and mind, one cannot become a Goswami. To achieve the highest success in life by becoming a Goswami and then a pure devotee of the Lord, one must follow the instructions known as Upadesh Amrita, which have been given by Srila Rupa Goswami. Srila Rupa Goswami has given many other books such as, such as, what other books did Rupa Goswami write? Yes, and what else? Lalita Madhava and? Vidagda Madhava, yes. But Upadesh Amrita uh, constitutes the first the first instruction for neophyte devotees. One should follow these instructions and study very strictly. Then it will be easier to make one's life successful. Hare Krishna. So this is Prabhupada's uh, preface. This is 1975, written in Vrindavan. Okay, so we'll go to the first text. You know the verse? Everybody know the verse, right? Who wants to chant it? Lead us, we will repeat. You know the verse? Yes, you know the verse, Prabhu? Chant. Vacho vegam manasakroda vegam Jiva vidam rupasta vegam Yes, very good. Chanted very well. Very well. Very nice. Do you know the translation? Okay, I'll read it anyway. We'll read it. Let's see. A sober person who can tolerate the urge to speak. The, first of all, a sober person who can tolerate the urge. The urge means the vega, vegas, right? The vegas, the urges. So the first one, the urge to speak. The mind's demands, the actions of anger and the urges of the tongue, belly and genitals is qualified to make disciples all over the world. Oh, so you say, oh, okay, it's okay, I'm not going to make disciples. <laughs> so for me it's not important, right? No. That's not the intention. But this is the first thing, the first, the first instruction, Upadesha Amrita, Prabhupada was saying these instructions are for neophytes. So this is the first instruction. And Lord Chaitanya said, become, everyone should become guru. Kiba vipra, yari deki tari kaho krishna upe, amara gaya, tara edi. So everyone, Lord Chaitanya's order, amara gaya, by my order become guru and save the world. You don't have to give diksha, but you have to give knowledge of Krishna. You may not be giving diksha, but at least we have to tell people about Krishna. In this way we become spiritual teacher. So this is the, the message. Uh, we have to understand the importance. So sober person who can Tolerate, tolerance, right? 
Where, where in Bhagavad Gita does Krishna speak about tolerance? Mm -hmm. The heat, tolerate the heat and the cold, the happiness and the distress, tolerate the difficulties. In, in Bhagavad Gita, in Srimad Bhagavatam also, there's a verse talking about tolerance. Hmm. Tatikshava uh, Karunika Suri, yes, what's the verse? What's the translation? These are the qualities of the Sadhu. Qualities of the Sadhu. Tolerance, merciful, friendly to. But there's another verse. Huh? Another verse. That, that's one with the texture of tolerance, one of the qualities of the sadhu. Tate no kampam. Right. Hmm. We tolerate all the difficulties, we accept them to be reactions due to our past deeds. But we go on engaging in devotional service. Then the result is that person becomes qualified to become my unalloyed devotee. Hmm? It becomes his rightful claim to go back to Godhead. So that tolerant. And here also Rupa Goswami is stressing here Sober person, a sober person. Did you hear this word sober? Do you remember hearing it before in Bhagavad Gita? Diras tatra namuyati, right. Diras, right, meaning sober. We say so, not drunk, right? <laughs> He's sober, he hasn't been drinking. And the sober person. So sober minded means. He's not intoxicated. The drunk people, they're intoxicated. So one who is sober-minded is controlling his mind. He's not proud or infatuated by his own position. He is sober. So he can tolerate, first of all, the urge of the the urge to speak, vacho vegam, right? That's the first section, very first thing, vacho vegam, the vega, the vega, the urge. So vacha, speaking. We like to speak, the nature of the tongue, especially women. Women really like to speak, right? Any of you married? You married? And if you're married, then you know about it, right? Yeah, and your wife's always meh, 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 meh. <laughs> The women always, they, they, they will speak much more than men. You know? The man's job is just uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. The women really like to talk. When the two women together, <laughs> they really have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 it's science, they studied it. You know, women talk about seven times more than men. <laughs> so you're lucky you're not in a woman's body. You know? so, so to control the tongue. Vacha. Vacho vegam. Controlling the tongue. Use the tongue to speak about Krishna, right? Some people, they try to stop talking. Monavrat. Hmm? Did you ever do monavrat? Yeah? You did it? No? You did it? Yeah? When? Once a week? One day a week? Or what? I had gone through a session in which they had made me not talk for three days. Three days, no talking. How did you find it? Difficult, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
three days, not talking. Yeah, they have these places. I was in Surat. I don't know when. You go to Surat, right? Who's the boy? Yeah, go to Surat, right? I remember when I went to the Surat temple many years ago, near to Surat temple there was this one place where people would come and they would, they would come, they could be locked in the room and nobody would disturb them, you know, no phone calls, nothing, you know, and they'd just be in the room on their own and they'd put the food through a little hole in the door and they would just be on their own, you know, just be like solitude. And people would pay money, they'd pay a lot of money to come just to be put in this room, to just be on their own without disturbance, you know, and just to enjoy the solitude, not speaking. I met one young man, he'd gone to live in a cave and he lived in a cave for a few months and he said after he came out of the cave, he said he had more desires than in the beginning. <laughs> so you have to be careful, you know, trying to do mono. You can stop. One time I was, I was traveling with Mahavishnu Swami, we were both brahmacharis and we were traveling in South India in 1970s and we had a van and we were distributing books. So. We were on this one road and we saw there was this mountain and we could see on the side of the mountain, somewhere in the middle of the mountain, there was a cave and there was a, a pathway to the cave and it was showing like there was a temple there and we could see there was a temple there. So we thought, oh, let's go, let's go and have a look, you know, we, you know we're just traveling there, we had time and so we thought, let's go over and see it. So. Uh, we went over, we went through the field, up the mountain, into the cave, and we found there's a sadhu in there. And the sadhu go, <laughs> you know, oh, oh, not speaking, yeah? Mm. So we, anyway, we started to talk to him. <laughs> He wasn't speaking, but he could hear. <laughs> so we started preaching to him and telling him about Krishna consciousness. And we showed him the Bhagavad Gita. And he wrote on his, he had a board with chalk, he wrote, how much is it? <laughs> and we sold him a book. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> I, I, can, I always remember it was so amazing. <laughs> One of these amazing things, you know, you never forget. Mm. And another, another place, uh, we went to this one village and they said, Oh, they said, in our village we have a guru here. So we, we, we thought, oh really, where's this, where's the guru? So we, we, they took us to the Guru's house, so we went to the Guru's, went to the Guru's house and we met the Guru and we started talking to him about Krishna consciousness and we showed him the books and we said we're preaching this message Bhagavad all over the world and everything. We sold him books, he bought books, you know. He was the Guru and we sold books to him. <laughs> And he bought the books, see, but he, he appreciated, he thought, understood. He was only preaching in one village. We were preaching all over the world. <laughs> so he bought some books, he appreciated. So using the tongue for the service of Krishna, that is very nice, nice service. Use our tongue to chant Hare Krishna and to sing the songs about Krishna and to preach the glories of Krishna. So that is proper use of the tongue. Mona Vrat, not a great help. Vachovigam Manasa, controlling the mind. So, more difficult to control the mind. One thing to control the tongue, Prabhu said difficult for three days to control the tongue. 
it's more difficult to control the mind. We know the mind is chanchalahi mana Krishna, right? Very difficult to control. Even Arjuna, and Arjuna is a great soul. What is our position? If even Arjuna has difficulty, then certainly we also have difficulty. We have to train the mind. Hmm? Train the mind. So train the mind by making it do what it doesn't want to do. The mind can be the en the mind can be the friend, the mind can be the enemy. We have to recognize when is the mind being a friend and when is it being an enemy. When the mind says, go ahead, eat more prasadam. You already had three plates, but it's really good, you know. <laughs> go ahead, have another couple of plates, you know. The mind will say, eat more, sleep more. The mind will say, don't chant. You chanted yesterday, you don't need to chant today. The mind will say, don't listen to class. Don't go for Sankirtan. Just take it easy, just relax. Just enjoy. So we have to learn. Train the mind. When is it a friend and when is it an enemy? Conquer the mind. For one who has conquered the mind, the mind is a friend. And for one who has failed to do so, his mind is the greatest enemy. Yes. So, vacho vigam manasa. And then anger. So the mind's demands and the reactions of anger. Very, very bad. I've been reading a bit of Valmiki Ramayan translated by Vidvan Goranga Prabhu and I was reading there in the Valmiki Ramayan he describes about how when Lord Rama has just found out he's supposed to go into live in the forest that Kaikeya wants that Ram should go to the forest he shouldn't be coronated but instead he should go and live in the forest for how many years? 14 years, right. So, when Lakshman hears, Lakshman gets really angry. He said, it's that father of ours. And he said, it's that, that he, he's henpecked by that Kaike, because the wives, you know, one. So Kaike had been preaching, had been talking to Dasarath and she's controlled Dasarath and she's got Dasarath, Maharaj Dasarath to send Ram off to the forest. He shouldn't be coronated. Bharat should be coronated. Lakshman is so angry. He said, I'll kill him. You know? yeah. He was so angry. And it just shows you what happens when you become angry that you can do the most terrible things. You know, Lakshman is you know, he's Vishnu Tattva. He's not an ordinary, but he's showing, in the, Valmiki is showing in the, that Ramayana in that incident, how dangerous that force of anger is. That you can do the most destructive, terrible activities if you don't control your passions. And that anger arises when, a, because our plans are not fulfilled. Lakshman wanted to see Lord Ramachandra coronated, but instead he is to go to the forest and accept the life of a tapasvi. And Lakshman is really angry and he's ready to kill even his father. So that's what happens if you don't control anger. You have to be very careful. So, the urge to speak, the mind's demands, and the actions of anger. You see what people do when they become angry. They slam the door, they slam things on the ground, and they speak so nastily, they will use the most disgusting language. 
right? You all know, right? We've all experienced sometimes maybe we're angry or maybe somebody's angry, we see somebody else very angry at us and how they use, how they display their anger. So anger is the younger brother of? Anger is the younger, younger brother of lust, yes. Kama Esha Kroda Esha Raja Guna Samurpapa Mahashano Mahapabma Right. By contemplating the objects of the senses, one becomes attached to them. From such attachment, lust develops. From lust, anger arises. From anger comes delusion. From delusion, bewilderment of memory. When the memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost and a person falls down again into the pool of material existence. Eight stages of fall down. We have to be very careful to control the mind and senses. So it began by contemplating, just thinking about sense gratification. Must be very careful to control the mind and not to contemplate. The mind will dwell. You have to bring it away from the, the thoughts of sense gratification. Bring it back to Krishna. From whatever the mind wanders, bring it back. So the minds demands the actions of anger and then the urges of tongue, belly, genitals. And Prabhupada explains a straight line. The tongue. The tongue is not controlled. We eat more. The belly gets bigger. Right? The belly gets bigger. It puts more pressure on the genitals. And the result is you lose semen, and you lose your blood, you lose your brain. Prabhupada said it takes one, six, uh, 16 mouthfuls of food to make one drop of blood, and then something like 30 drops of blood to make one drop of semen. People don't understand the glories of celibacy. If you can practice celibacy, strict celibacy, you don't let your semen go down, then you can have a very strong mind and intelligence, very sharp memory. Just like Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, because he was a Naistika Brahmachari, so he was very very sharp intelligence, very good memory, knew so many slokas and very powerful in preaching because he practiced celibacy, right? Tapashya brahmacharyena samena cha damena cha, right? So that brahmacharya, well, brahmacharya is also there in household life. If somebody is married, okay, grihasta brahmachari. That's also very good. You can be like Prabhupada. Gorgovinda Maharaj was a He was Grihastha Brahmachari. So the good the, the good Brahmachari will make a good Grihastha. And then he'll go on from Grihastha life, he can go on to Sanya. Because he's in control of the mind and senses. There was one Maharaj, maybe did you ever meet him? Uh, uh, what, what was it? Uh, that one from uh, Nasik. Uh, Mahavishnu Goswami. Mahavishnu Goswami. Did you, you wouldn't, maybe meet him, you, you're all quite new. He, he already passed away. Anyway, his name was Mahavishnu Goswami. He was an elderly Gujarati man. He actually joined Krishna consciousness in the UK. 
I came back to India, I preached in India. And so anyway, he used to tell, he had many, quite a few disciples, he had some very nice disciples, very learned disciples. So he, he used to say that it's better to leave home and then the family will say, where did he go? But if you don't leave home, if you stay at home, they'll say, when are you going? <laughs> because as you get old, in your old age, the family won't want you around. Because they have to take care of you, you know, the old. So they'll say, when are you going? So before they say, when are you going, it's better you go on your own. And they'll say, where did he go? Just like Maharaj Judasir said, where did they go? When, when Dhritarashtra and Gandhari left with Vidura, Maharaj Judasir said, where did they go? I have been cheated by these great souls. So, the idea is, Grihastha life, Brahmachari life, it's good. Controlling the senses, you have to control the senses. I was distributing books in the Philippines one time with one man. I met this one man, he was a lawyer. And so he was asking me about celibacy and I told him how semen is actually blood. And he said, what? What? No! <laughs> he could not believe it, you know. He was, he was, he did not, he had no idea, you know, because he was just an ordinary materialistic man, you know, he's enjoying sense gratification. And I explained to him that actually semen is made from blood, and when you discharge semen, you're actually losing your own blood. And he was like, what? Ah. <laughs> it was like a, just something new to him, he just could not believe it. But actually it's a fact. And later on he met, he asked the doctor, and the doctor also told him, yeah, this is true. So, pe uh, in intelligent people in practice this brahmachari life and it's very good for developing the brain, keep good intelligence. All right, so we'll read from Prabhupada's purport. Prabhupada begins, In Srimad Bhagavatam, Parikshit Maharaj placed a number of intelligent questions before Sukadeva Goswami. Right? Parikshit Maharaj, what question did he place? And he's, Prabhupada said he had a number of questions. What was the que main question Sukadeva Goswami was asked by Maharaj Parikshit? Maharaj Parikshit wanted to know? Right, yes. What's the duty? About to die. That's a real question, right? Here it Prabhupada says, one of these questions was, why do people undergo atonement if they cannot control their senses? Undergo atonement, you know, you've done something wrong and you want to atone for it you know maybe maybe you stole something or maybe you told a lie or you, you did something wrong you you want to atone for it maybe you didn't go to mongol arti one day you want to atone for it and Prabhupada told what the atonement is you know huh? No, Prabhupada didn't say that. Prabhupada said the atonement was, you have to distribute one Krishna book. <laughs> Prabhupada was talking about, actually he was talking about uh, SK, SK Singhanias, uh, the Kanpur people. There, there's one family, uh, is it SK Singhanias? Uh, anyway, there's one famous family in Kanpur, and they're, they're Hindus, voted Hindus, and they have a temple in their home. And everybody in the family, they have to go to temple every day. And if they don't go to temple, they get fined. It's the, the, fam the head of the family made that custom, 
and that there's a pujari there in charge of the temple, and does the puja, and he keeps a note who's coming to Mongol Arti and who's, who are, who's coming to the temple that day and who didn't come. Somebody didn't come to the temple, the, puj the pu pujari will tell him, oh, you did not come to temple yesterday, you have to pay fine. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. And they'll pay. It's a, it's a custom in that family. So Prabhupada was talking, he said, same way in our Krishna consciousness movement, you don't come to Mongol Arti, there will be fine. And fine is you have to distribute one Krishna book. <laughs> this was in Los Angeles in the, in the heydays of book distribution, you see. Prabhupada was encouraging. Okay, so atonement. And do, do some atonement. For instance, in this, in this, uh, for instance, a thief may know perfectly well that he may be arrested for the stealing. And he may actually even see a thief arrested by the police. Yet, he continues to steal. Right? That's a, we see people like that. But of course, that kind of punishment, it doesn't really stop people from doing sinful activities. Some, some people maybe, but generally, it's not really a very effective way to cure people. Prabhupada was in America and he saw this magazine, it said, I think it was Time magazine, and the cover of the magazine was crime, what to do because there was so much crime in USA. So many stealings and murders and violence and all oh, horrible things going. And they were wondering what to do because the prisons were so full. So many people in the jail. So they wondered what is it. And Prabhupada said, I have the solution. I can give them the solution. So when Prabhupada got to the next city, they arranged for Prabhupada to meet with the head of the police force. The head of the police de department came to meet Prabhupada. And he was happy to hear from Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was telling him how we could solve the crime problem. And Prabhupada's solution was, we'll have everybody come and they will, they can, de they can have prasadam and kirtan. Just by prasadam and kirtan. He said, we will solve all the crime problems. This was probably, he said, just if the, if the government will support us, he said, we can, we can solve this problem. The government give us a place and, we, uh, and help and sponsor the, the prasadam, and we will do the rest. We'll, do, we'll cook everything and distribute it and we'll have kirtan and, and you'll see the crime problem will be solved. This was Prabhupada. Prabhupada was preaching like this. Another man had a factory and Prabhupada was telling the man, because the man was saying it's very difficult running the factory, there was always so many troubles with the workers and so on. And Prabhupada said, you should have the people Krishna conscious. He said, every day we should have kirtan. Before the, he said, in the, every morning when the people come to work, there should be kirtan. And then you should have also prasadam for them. He said, then people will be happy to work for you. Nobody will want to leave. People will be steady. So, <laughs> Prabhupada had these ideas. He wanted everywhere Krishna consciousness. Okay, so the problem is atonement. The thief, he wants to steal. Oh. So Prabhupada said, experience is gathered by hearing and seeing. One who is less intelligent gathers experience by seeing. One who is more intelligent gathers experience by hearing. When an intelligent person hears from the law books and shastra, or scriptures that stealing is not good 
and hears that a thief is punished when arrested, he refrains from theft. A less intelligent person may first have to be arrested and punished for stealing to learn to show to learn to stop stealing. However, a rascal, a foolish man, may have the experience of both hearing and seeing and may even be punished, but still he continues to steal. Even if such a person atones and is and is punished by the government, he will again commit he will again commit theft as soon as he comes out of jail. If punishment in jail if punishment in jail is is considered atonement what is the benefit of such atonement? If punishment in jail is considered atonement, then what is the benefit of such atonement? There's no benefit because you're still going to steal. And you can see many ways, many examples of this kind of thing in the material world. In the nectar of devotion, Prabhupada talks about the man who may get a sexual disease. Sexual disease. There, there are different terrible sexual diseases. You know, they have that thing called herpes, and then there was AIDS. Now they have AIDS. Of course, that's very that's a killer disease. People suffer a lot. They get by sexual transmission. So they get these diseases and they suffer, they undergo painful treatment, but still they don't give up the desire. They still have the, the desire for sin. So what is the benefit of all that punishment? It, there's no real benefit. Just like putting people in jail, they realize putting people in prison is not really changing people. So they, they stopped calling it prison, they started calling it a correction institute to correct people. They thought change the name may help, you know, <laughs> try to change people. So try to rectify the, the mentality, the mood of stealing doing thin, sinful activities, to get people to give up these sinful activities. Once they start doing sinful activities, it's difficult to stop. There's one devotee working with uh, preaching to drug young people who take drugs. And they have a program to help people to get off drugs. And they have a diff, you know, some people get really addicted to drugs, it's very difficult for them to get off. And what they have to do, the real test that they've really given up drugs, is when they go, they have to go and preach to somebody else to tell them to give up drugs. That's the final step in their cure. When they actually go to preach to others to get them away from drugs then that's the sign that they're really given up drugs. So just like in Krishna consciousness, when we become really convinced about Krishna consciousness, we want to go and give it to others. You don't want to keep it for yourself. I came to India in the 1970s, first of all. So in the 1970s, the people kept water in clay pots. We had these earthen pots. Sometimes maybe when you go to Vrindavan, we use earthen cups, you know. And so they had these earthen pots. We wouldn't keep water in refrigerators. There were not so many refrigerators in the 1970s. But people would keep the water in a clay pot. So you put the water in a clay pot, 
but the problem is because it's earthen pot, it's porous and the water gradually evaporates out. So the same way Krishna Consciousness. You get Krishna Consciousness and if you don't preach, if you don't use it, if you don't give it to others, it will just evaporate. It will dry up. Just like we learn slokas. If you don't use them regularly, what happens? Yeah, forget them, right? You have to regularly be using them, reciting them. Then you start to remember them. That's a so Krishna consciousness is like that. You have to use it regularly. You have to preach it and that way you keep it alive, you keep it fresh. But if you don't use it, if you just think, oh I'm a devotee, I'm Krishna conscious, and you don't do any preaching, you don't give any Krishna conscious, then it dries up. So, uh, did Hanuman Prasak Swami ever come here? Hanuman Prasak Swami? No? No, he's a wonderful preacher. Uh, he, he says, he said, you don't have to know very much, but you have to use what you know. So, you see, this is not a very big book, is it? It's not a very big book. But if you learn everything in this book, you'll have a very good knowledge of Krishna consciousness. There are so many points, so many wonderful slokas and so many nice points of examples, analogies and so on that if you just know this one book, you could give wonderful preaching, you can preach to anybody. This is the beauty of Krishna consciousness. This, this is one book you want to keep with you wherever you go, you know, you can distribute it, show it to people. Even that when they read that first verse, you know, the urge of the, the tongue, the belly and the genitals, then people are, wow, oh. <laughs> you know, ordinary materialistic people, they, they're impressed when they read this, they can under, Oh, this is something very special, you know. They never heard anything like this before. You don't get this kind of knowledge in your newspaper or watching television. You don't get this kind of stuff in a Bollywood movie. This is the treasure of Rupa Goswami. We were te we told yesterday Bhaktivinoda Thakur found this book. He was in ecstasy. Wow, one. Now he just found the eleven slokas, and then they added the purports, and we're getting Bhakti Vinod, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, and our own Srila Prabhupada. We're getting the real heavy nectar. Three great acharyas all telling us about Krishna consciousness. All right, so Prahlad Maharaj, he's inquiring, he said, he said, he compared atonement to an elephant's bathing. Right, you all know this example, the elephant bathing. The elephant may take a very nice bath in the river, but as soon as he comes out, as soon as he comes onto the bank, it throws dirt all over the body. What then is the value of its bathing? We have two elephants in Mayapur, right? And you can see, you know, they bathe them regularly. There's, they have the caretakers, men are there full time to take <laughs> care of them. Every day you have to take them for walks, you know. They get so big. They eat so much, they eat 
all these leaves and banana trees and branches, mango leaves. And uh, they, ba they, have, they bathe and then when they come out, they throw the dirt all over their bodies again. One time, the, the previous elephant, before those two elephants came, the previous elephant, they took it to bathe in the Ganga one day, but somehow she couldn't get out. Once she got in the Ganga, it was really difficult to get out because, you know, it's so muddy sometimes. The mud on the bank of the Ganga is so slippy and muddy. So she was coming out and the mud would fall in and she'd fall back in the river. And she was crying, you know, she was really distressed because she couldn't get out the Ganga. But then after some time, you know, it went on for a few hours, they, they, they got the idea, move her down the river, further down the river where there were some stones and a heavier, firmer bank. And they moved her down the river and there they got her out, she got out there. But she was so disturbed, she didn't eat for three days. She was so disturbed at, you know, not being able to get out of the river. So, elephants, they don't, they don't have a very easy time, you know, it's very difficult in an elephant body. And we know about Gajendra, you know, he... When, when the Lord came and killed the crocodile, Gajendra was thinking, hey! I called you to come, why did you kill the crocodile? I was the one who called for you. You should have killed me, I'm still here in this elephant body. I want to get, I want to get liberated from this body. You killed the crocodile. You should have killed me. <laughs> I have to live in the elephant body. Oh. Okay. Similarly, many spiritual, many spiritual practitioners chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and at the same time commit many forbidden things, thinking that their chanting will counteract their offenses. Which offense is that? Which, which number of offenses is that? Seven. Number seven. Okay. Okay, of the ten types of offenses one can commit while chanting the holy name of the Lord, this offense is called Namno Baladyashyahi Papa Bhuti, committing sinful activities on the strength of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Similarly, certain Christians go to church to confess their sins. This is the Catholic, Roman Catholic tradition. They have this tradition, go to confession every week. So they confess their sins thinking that confessing their sins before a priest and performing some penance will relieve them, will relieve them from the results of their weekly sins. As soon as Saturday is over and Sunday comes, they again begin their sinful activities, experiencing or expecting to be, to be forgiven the next Sunday or next Saturday. So you go to confession, the Catholic Church, they have that, they have the priest and the person has to go in and you have to tell the priest, all right, did you do any sins? What do you want to get forgiven for? Oh yes, I, I went drinking with all my friends and we drank a lot of alcohol. Oh, all right, very bad. You have to do, you have to chant Hail Marys. You have to chant 10 rosaries or something like, they have the rosary but mala, you know, 54 beats on their rosary. And they will chant, Hail Mary, Mother of God, have mercy on my soul. And they chant like that. They do a rosary. It's called the rosary. So, this way, every week they go. All right, what sins did you do this week? 
Oh, I fought with my mother, I called my mother a bitch, I called her, you know. <laughs> oh, very terrible, all right, you have to chant five Hail Mary rosaries of five Hail Mary, you know, they will tell them how many times you have to chant rosaries. <laughs> okay, so this way they get forgiven. Every week they go, get forgiven for them. So this kind of prayaschit or atonement is condemned by Parikshit Maharaj, the most intelligent king of his time. Sukadeva Goswami, equally intelligent as befitting the spiritual master of Maharaj Parikshit, answered the king and confirmed that the statement, the statement con, con the statement concerning atonement was correct. A sinful activity cannot be counteracted by a, an, a pious activity. The real prayaschit atonement is the awakening of one's dormant Krishna consciousness. We want to get free of our sins, we have to become Krishna conscious. If we go on, in the nectar of devotion, of course, Prabhupada discusses this very clearly about desire, right? What's the cause of sinful activity? And where does desire to enjoy material come from? Huh? Ignorance, right. Avidya, ignorance, yes. From ignorance comes a desire for sinful activity. And you do sinful activity, you suffer, you bring suffering. And so, ignorance, this is a real problem of sinful, the root of sin is ignorance. We have to get people out of ignorance. Real atonement involves coming to real knowledge and for, for this there is a standard process. Uh, there's a process to come to real knowledge. When one follows a regulated hygienic process, he does not fall sick. A human being is meant to be is meant to be trained according to certain principles to revive his original knowledge. Such a methodical life is described as tapasya, right? Who said we, who, Lord Rishabdev told his 100 sons about tapasya, right? Do you know where that is in Srimad Bhagavatam? Fifth canto, fifth canto, Lord Rishabdev is described, right? He had a 100 sons. And Prabhupada liked to lecture on that first verse. What's the verse? Right. So translation? This human form of life is not meant for uh, eating and sleeping, which is even available for the stool eaters, dog and hog. This human form of life is meant for tapasya, by which one can get unlimited amount of happiness. Mm. Yeah, by doing, first of all you do tapasya, by tapasya you will purify yourself. And when we're purified, then we can go on to experience real happiness. You can see the young men in Srimad Bhagavatam, like Daksha's sons. You know the sons of Daksha, they had 10,000 sons and then 1,000 sons and they were to get married, right? But before he got them married, go and do tapasya. And the prachetas also, they were doing tapasya before marriage. It's customary. In the Buddhist culture, in Thailand, you can see the people in Thailand that uh, before becoming, before their marriage, the young man will go and live in the monastery and be a monk. He'll shave his head, put on the monk's robes 
and become a monk. Become a monk for six months or one month or a year, whatever they decide. But they do that, live in the monastery, beg every day. They just live by begging and eating two meals a day and just staying in the monastery, being with the monks. And then when after a period is up, then they do another ceremony and they go out, go back, they get married. They're, it's a purification, prepares them for married life. Mm -hmm. So Rich, Lord Rishabdev, he was telling also his sons, hundred sons, tapasya. Do tapasya, purify yourself, then you will experience real happiness. So, Young people, you tell young people, Prabhu, you know, before you get married, go and do some tapasya. Huh? You must be joking, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know they cannot imagine, they cannot think of it. But if they did that, they would be much better. Their, their, their household life would be much more successful. It's a very valuable principle. And we see, people who have been good brahmacharis, they will make good householders. They will be successful in family life. Mm. So, Prabhupada then talks about this process. What is this process of purification? Uh, is it, where, where was I? Such a methodical life is yeah, right, yeah. I'm just trying to find where, where that was. Okay, yeah. One can be gradually elevated to the standard of real knowledge or Krishna consciousness by practicing austerity and celibacy, brahmacharya, by controlling the mind, by controlling the senses, by giving up one's possessions in charity, by being avowed truthful, by keeping clean, and by practicing yoga asanas. So you can see, you go to some Mayavadi yoga ashram, you know, they try to encourage, like, they do things like that. If you go up to Rishikesh or Hardwar, somewhere where the yoga ashrams are, you know, they do yoga asanas and they have the class early in the morning so people will wake, have to wake up early and diet will be vegetarian, mm, like that. Some basic things they learn. But you can see in our Krishna consciousness movement, you can get the real, the full process in the morning program in Krishna consciousness. You come and live in the ashram in Krishna consciousness, it's much better than anything you could get in any yoga ashram. You, in the yoga ashram you're getting a little bit. In our Krishna consciousness movement we get everything, the full process. All the, pre all the parts are there. The knowledge, the philosophy, so much greater and deeper. And some people come to Krishna consciousness just to get that and then they go away, they go back to another, go to some other society, oh they're big devotees, they're big people, you know, they, they leave Krishna consciousness, they go somewhere else and they get a big position because they, they've learned so much, they know so much, so much more than the other people. Okay, and then, however, if one is fortunate enough to get the association of a pure devotee, he can easily surpass all the practices for controlling the mind by the mystic yoga process, simply by following the regulated principles of Krishna consciousness, remaining free from illicit sex, meat-eating, intoxication and gambling, and by engaging in the service of the Supreme Lord under the direction of the bona fide spiritual master. 
This easy process is being recommended by Srila Rupa Goswami. We can understand how fortunate we are to have the Krishna Consciousness Movement. You know, we could read the book and we could think, oh yes, very nice, you know, but how to do it? How to ever practice these things? But the Krishna Conscious Lifestyle is so easily available for us in the Krishna Conscious Center. You live in the Krishna Conscious Center, then it, it's so easy, it's so natural, you don't even think about it. And it's, it's actually joyful. And you, sometimes uh, when I was preaching in other countries, you know, people are surprised, they think, is this a religion? <laughs> they, 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 they couldn't under, because it was just so, it was so joyful, it was so happy and everybody, you know, all the, all the activities we're, we were doing, you know, having nice food and singing nice songs and every, everything was so good, they were enjoying everything. And then somehow they, is this a religion? <laughs> it was just puzzling to them because they, other religions, they do not have anywhere, anything, anywhere near to compare to the Krishna conscious activity. <coughs> And the yoga studios, the yoga, these different swamis, you know, they'll teach you, torture you. To, <laughs> all the aches and the pains, you know, doing all the yoga asanas and meditating. And they close your eyes, they slap you. <laughs> right? So much difficulties in the other processes. But Krishna consciousness is so easy, so joyful. Without any difficulty you can make advancement. Other processes just so much pain. And they say no pain, no gain, right? <laughs> you have to have a lot of pain to make a little gain. But in Krishna consciousness we don't we, it, it's all joy. It's all, there's no pain, but there's a lot of gain. Very special. Mm. So Prabhupada continues, first one must control the speaking power. Every one of us has the power of speech. As soon as we get an opportunity, we begin to speak. Just like Prabhu was saying, he went to one place and for three days no speaking. Some people I met, they went to the Buddhist retreat for the weekend. And the, the Buddhist retreat, they were brought in, they said, <coughs> sit down, you know, and there were people in the room. And they said, just sit down, don't speak to anybody. Right? Just sit down and don't speak. And they were... You know, and they sit, and he sit like that, you know, for three hours. And after three, okay, we're going to have lunch now. And then they go for lunch, and they come back in the afternoon. Don't speak to anybody. <laughs> so the, so the, the whole day, you know, sit and meditate. Don't speak, just sit. Do, you know. This is the, the Buddhist process, you know eat something and then meditate, more meditation. <laughs> Not very joyful. There's no, there's no real pleasure there. As, you know, sometimes they say, well, there's no suffering. <laughs> well, in some ways there is, it, 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 it can be suffering just to sit. One devotee studied yoga. He had a very famous yoga master, the one devotee I know, he's an Astanga yogi teacher, famous Astanga yogi teacher in America. And he studied yoga asanas in India from a man called Pratabi Joyce, who was a disciple of uh, Krishna Charya, Krishnananda Charya, famous yogi. And they were all, you know, Sri Vaishnava, Ramanuja, but yogis. So. Uh, 
He said he studied yoga from him, but he said he just the body would ache so much. You just sit, you know, to do pranayama, the nose pressing, you know, breathing, just and just sit and sit and don't move, sit straight. How long you can do it? Hmm? How long you can sit straight? Hmm? Sit like a yogi, right? Sit up. Sit up. <laughs> you sit up, sit straight, put your handphones away, don't look at your handphone, switch off your handphone. You sit up like a yogi. How long you can sit like a yogi? How long you can do it? You know, it's not very easy. The body will ache. And they will do it the whole day. <laughs> Yeah, this that this is what they do for learn to learn yoga. They suffer so much, so much suffering. We learn the topmost yoga without any suffering, without any pain. We can learn the highest yoga, the topmost yoga. So we want to appreciate how Prabhupada has given us this wonderful process. Okay, uh, so Prabhupada then says, mm -hmm. If we do not speak about Krishna consciousness, we speak about all sorts of nonsense. A toad in a field speaks by croaking, and similarly everyone who has a tongue wants to speak, even if he has to say, even if all he has to say is nonsense. The, the meaning, of the, the croaking of the toad, however, simply invites the snake, please come here and eat me. Right? You all know the croaking of the frogs. Right? What's the, let me hear, croak like a frog. Prabhupada has these sounds very good. <laughs> and Prabhupada has the sound of the snake coming also to get the frog. <laughs> the snake comes and eats a frog. So the, the, the frog is croaking and the snake is thinking, here's my supper. And he goes to eat the frog. So, our speaking, nonsense talk, is like that, like the croaking of the frog. Nevertheless, although it is inviting death, the toad goes on croaking. The talking of materialistic man and impersonalist Mayavadi philosophers may be compared to the croaking of frogs. They are always speaking nonsense and thus inviting death to catch them. Controlling speech, however, does not mean self-imposed silence. The external process of mona as Mayavadi philosophers. So the Mayavadi philosophers, their process is negation. Buddhists also, they like to negate everything because the Buddhists, they say, they say nothing is real. There was even, there was this one man in Prabhupada's time, there was one man, he was saying that all speaking is nonsense, we don't need to say anything. So Prabhupada said, then why is he speaking? <laughs> why didn't he just keep quiet? <laughs> defeat, proper defeat, you know. So, this is, this goes on. In Srimad Bhagavatam it describes, Ayur Hariti Vaipum Sam, right? As the sun is rising and setting, what happens? Reduces the duration of life, except for yeah, except for those who are chanting the glories of the Lord. So
So the devotees of the Lord, they, they don't, their, their life is different. But the other people, as the sun is rising and setting, duration of life is reduced with their nonsense talking. So silence or mona may be helpful for some time, but ultimately it proves a failure. The meaning of controlled speech conveyed by Srila Rupa Goswami advocates a positive process of Krishna Kata, engaging the speaking process in glorifying the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. The, can, the tongue can thus glorify the name, form, qualities and pastimes of the Lord. The preacher of Krishna Kata is always beyond the clutches of death. This is the significance of controlling the urge to speak. So this is something we can all endeavor, try to endeavor for, to utilize the tongue to speak Krishna Kata. Of course, sometimes, just for the sake of meeting people, we would see Prabhupada meet people, just like, you know, bring a life member to Prabhupada to meet Prabhupada. So Prabhupada would ask them, oh, uh, what is your business and like that, you know, be friendly with them. In England, Prabhupada met one man, he was a, a famous racing car driver. He was driving in the Formula One. Formula One means the top, the very top speed motor cars. So Prabhupada was talking to him and the man was explaining, he said, sometimes we're driving it's a very near to death. So Prabhupada picked up on that, immediately began to speak about Krishna conscious philosophy. So Prabhupada could relate everything to Krishna. And the man appreciated this man. He could understand how nice Prabhupada was. How, that Prabhupada was hearing the man speak about being near to death. And Prabhupada explained to him, yes, actually death is there for all of us. Devotee can see death around us. Therefore, we have to keep ourselves in Krishna consciousness, right? What did Maharaj Kulashekar say? Yes? Yes, right. This is very nice verse. Maharaj Kulashekar. Actually, Maharaj Kulashekar, he's a Ram Bhakta, but he gives his verse, Krishna Tvatiya. Oh, chant the name of Krishna, I don't know, I, I haven't been able to understand why, but he didn't say Rama but he's generally known as a Ram Bhakta, but that verse is Krishna, and that verse is very well known in India, particularly in South India, because Kulashekar is one of the Alwars. One of the great hours. So let me die now when we can still chant. That is good. Good thinking. Are you ready to die? <laughs> we have to chant the holy name. We're preparing. We have to practice for that, right? So. Uh, So, the restlessness or fickleness of the mind, manoviga, is controlled when, when one, can, one can fix the mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. Who fixed his mind on the lotus feet of Krishna? Yes, Ambarish Maharaj, right? 
And what did he do after he fixed his mind on the lotus feet of Krishna? He used his senses. Hmm? He engaged his senses in the mind. He used his legs in traveling the Holy Spirit. So, Vaimana Krishna, Padara Vindeo. Vaimana Krishna, Ah, Chakra, okay, yes, right. Many activities he did, right? He was using all his senses in the service of Krishna. But the very first thing to fix the mind on the lotus feet of Krishna, that's the important. Get the mind right, fix the mind. So chanting Hare Krishna, before we do our japa in the morning, we want to fix the mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. Sometimes we offer prayers before chanting our japa. We are chanting Shikshastika. It's a meditation on fixing the mind on Krishna. So then Prabhupada quotes Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna Suryasam, Mayahaya Andaka, Yahan Krishna. Krishna is like, and Maya is like, if the sun is present, then there's no dark. Similarly, if Krishna is present in the mind, then there is no possibility of the mind being agitated by maya. When we wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you have to do? First thing you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you have to do? Huh? Yeah. What about the mind? What's the first thing we have to do with the mind? Beat the mind, right, yeah, beat the mind, right. Beat the mind with stick or shoes or something, right? And then last thing at night, then beat the mind again, yeah. This is training the mind, right? <laughs> The yoga process of negating all material thoughts will not help. Just saying no, not this, not that, no, that's not the way. Mm -hmm. To try to create a vacuum in the mind is artificial. The vacuum will not remain. However, if one always thinks of Krishna, and how to serve Krishna, then one's mind will naturally be controlled. So making a vacuum in the mind, make the mind empty, that's not going to work. The people, they try to do that, the Buddhists, the Mayavadis, right? Hear, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, they try. Will the mind be empty? No. Still so many things in the mind. Mm -hmm. So, how to deal with this? By fill the mind with Krishna. If you fill the mind with Krishna, then you can conquer it. You know, the Buddhists, they give that story. There's a man, the man came to the Buddhist master. He said, oh, master, I'm so attached, how can I let go of my material attachments? How can I get free of all my material attachments? So the master said, just wait, after some time I will tell you. So after a little while, the, the disciple heard the master calling, help, help, save me, save me. So the, the, the the student went running to look for his master to see what was wrong. And he saw his master was holding, his arms was around a big tree. He was holding the tree, he was saying, Help! Let me go! Let me go! And so the, the student said to his master, he said, Master Guruji, what's wrong? 
He said, I want to get free. So, so the Guru said, yes. The Guru, Guru said, I want to get free. And so the, the student said to him, Guruji, you are holding the tree just like go. So then the Guru turned and said to the student, he said, yes. You want to get free of your attachment? This is what you have to do. You have to let go. Right? You're holding on, just let go. So our Krishna conscious process is let go of the material and hold on to Krishna. Don't just let go. Just If you just let go, then it's empty. But again, you want to hold on to something. Again, something will come. So what you have to do is change the attachment from the material to the spiritual. Attachment to the material is the cause of the greatest bondage. But that same attachment for the spiritual leads to perfection, the greatest enlightenment. We have to change our attachment. Fill the mind with thought of Krishna. That's why we read Krishna book. Read the books. Read Srimad Bhagavatam. Read about Krishna. Go and see the deities. Go and see the deities and look at the beautiful clothes the deities are wearing and see how the deities are decorated and chant the holy name and recite the slokas. This will help us to fill the mind, the thought of Krishna. Reciting slokas, sometimes people they don't like this. Oh, I have to learn these slokas. Oh, I have to learn the translation. Oh, they, they think there's so much trouble. It's very good for the mind. It's very good to fill the mind in thought of Krishna because it's pure sound vibration. Shabda Brahman. You're hearing the words of Krishna. So we want to control the mind. There's a process. You can do it. People were asking me the question and answers, how to control the mind? I said, chant, chant loudly. Louder you chant, more powerful it becomes, right? You chant loudly, you can experience. I chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Isn't it true? It's so easy. You know, chant loud, you know, you think of Krishna. You know? it, it, this is a process. Follow. follow. Prabhupada, uh, somebody asked Prabhupada, what to do with the mind when I chant? Prabhupada said, you use the tongue to chant and the ears to hear. There's no question of the mind. <laughs> if we're using the tongue and the ears, you don't worry about them. The problem is, we're not attentive when we're chanting. We're not chanting attentive. Then we have to chant with proper attention. And then you see the effect. Similarly, anger can be controlled. There's an anger management thing on the internet. You know, anger management, they're sending you things all the time. How to control anger. Such a common thing. So many people are victims are controlled by their anger and they display this terrible anger sometimes. They get so angry. Hell has no fury like the wrath of a woman. <laughs> There's a famous movie. It's a famous movie in England a long time ago. The, the, I said, hell has no fury like the wrath of a woman. <laughs> Yeah. Hell, of course, is very bad, very few, even worse, make a woman angry. <laughs> so, that's a, a warning, you know, you have to deal very carefully with the fair sex. Don't make them angry. Deal nicely with them. 
So anger can be controlled. We, we cannot stop anger altogether. But if we simply become angry with those who blaspheme the Lord or the devotees of the Lord, we control our anger in Krishna consciousness. Now you have to be a bit careful about this because we think people say, well we can use anger in Krishna's service, right? You can use anger in Krishna's service. So you can beat your wife, you can beat your kids, you, know, you get angry at your kid, you beat them. That's not right. You're not supposed to do that. Somebody, you, somebody cheats you, you get angry at them. We have to control anger. Unless you're the master, don't try to use anger. Unless you're the master of your senses, don't try to use anger. First be the master of the senses. Then you may think about using anger in special situations. And Prabhupada is going to give some examples, right? Some, where could we use anger? What is a good example of using anger? Hanuman burning Lanka. Yes. Yes, good. Hanuman got angry. Arjuna fighting on the battlefield. Yeah. And Lord Chaitanya? Jagai Madai. Right. Lord, when Lord Nityananda was struck, then Lord Chaitanya was very angry. He was ready to kill Jagai and Madai because they had injured Lord Nityananda. So we can get angry at people who hit a devotee. We defend devotees, but for ourselves we tolerate. Somebody hits you, what are you going to do? Huh? Somebody hits you, what are you supposed to tolerate? Right. Turn. Turn. You're supposed to. And somebody else should come and hit them. <laughs> We should tolerate the uh, idea. Sometimes, you know, there's a common saying, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right. Tooth for a t an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But, they say, if you follow this principle, it will not be good. The result will? The result will be none of us will have any eyes and none of us will have any teeth. <laughs> so, what should we do? We should simply tolerate. We should think, I must have offended them in my previous life. And that's why they're just... One devotee was distributing books in the airport in America. Very nice devotee, a very good book distributor. And, you know, he's young man, well built, not weak, and he was distributed, he offered the man a book, and the man <laughs> punched him in the face. So what does he do? He said, thank you Krishna. He's very sense controlled. Now he, he could have fought him, he was a, you know, he was a strong man, he, and he's not cowardly. But, philosophically, it's not the right thing to do. You should tolerate. Somebody hits you, you should tolerate. Thank you, Krishna. You fight back, what good does it do? Just create a big scene. His purpose, the devotee is there to distribute books. The man doesn't want a book. Okay. Leave it. But don't get physical. Don't fight. Just tolerate. See it as a test from Krishna. Just like Lord Buddha was tested, Lord Jesus Christ was tested, Haridas Thakur was tested. So in the same way, when we go for preaching, we will, there will be tests. 
And the test can come like that. Physical violence, people can abuse you. You have to tolerate. We have to go on with our service. Okay? So, Lord Chaitanya wrote, Trinada pi sunichena One should be tolerant then one should be tolerant than the grass and more tolerant than the tree. One may then ask why the Lord why the Lord exhibited his anger. Hmm. The, the point is that one should be ready to tolerate all results to one's own self. But when Krishna or his pure devotee is blasphemed, a genuine devotee becomes angry and acts like fire against the offenders. Kroda, anger cannot be stopped, but it can be applied rightly. It, it was in anger that Hanuman set fire to Lanka, but he is worshipped as the greatest devotee of Lord Ramachandra. This means that he utilized his anger in the right way. Arjuna serves as another example, he was not willing to fight, but Krishna incited his anger. You must fight. To fight without anger is not possible. Anger is controlled, however, when utilized in the service of the Lord. But be cautious. Unless you're the master of the senses, don't try to use anger. Why? What's going to happen if you try to use anger and you're not the master of the senses? The sense of discrimination will be gone. So we might do what our mind is saying. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Prabhupada says in Gita in one of the Padpur that our body gets disturbed. Body. Physical body gets disturbed. It will be controlled by anger. Not mm. We may not use it for the service of Lord, but for our own sense. Right, right. That's right. Yes. We, we, the anger will degrade us and it becomes our own sense gratification. We take pleasure in beating someone. <laughs> That's not proper use of anger. Anger has its utility, but you have to be cautious. Otherwise, it will simply degrade us, as we said. Person falls down again into the material pool. So, it all comes from lust. With lust, we have desire, and if we get the desire, we become greedy for more. And if we don't get the desire, we become angry. So, lust, anger and greed. Three gates to hell. And the initiator, lust. So it's lust, the all-devouring sinful enemy. And so, how to conquer over lust? How are you going to conquer lust? What's, how is it described in Bhagavad Gita? To conquer lust, yes? You have to use our spiritual intelligence. Yes, you have to have spiritual intelligence. How are you going to get that? By practice. By practice. By studying Shastra. You have to study Shastra. By reading Shastra, studying the Shastras, yes. And also one more thing, regulating the senses. By regulating the senses, curb this 
all devouring sinful enemy of man. So regulation of the senses, very helpful to us to control the mind and senses. That's another advantage, being in the Krishna conscious society. Everything is regulated. Every day we wake up, certain time. Every day we have Mangal Arti, time. Every day we have Prasadam, certain times. That regulation is very powerful to our, for our mind and senses. Without staying in the Krishna conscious center, without in that, so, then we get very unregulated. Often maybe when you're traveling, right? When you're traveling on the buses and so on, when you're out on traveling Sankirtan, then sometimes we're not so regulated. Is it? Yeah, difficult to be regulated when you're out traveling from the temple. And you don't have the temple program so well. You're staying in the van, staying in a bus or something, dharmashala. It's not quite the same. But here in the temple, you know, I know myself, when we would go out traveling, it would always be a relief to come back to the temple and to be in the temple and have the regulated program again. Because when you're out traveling around, you lose that regulation. And when you lose the regulation, then the mind and the senses are not so controlled. So it's very helpful to have that regulation. Keep our Krishna consciousness. Okay, what time should we go to? Are there any questions? Any, any time? Yes? Maharaj, so regarding three modes of material nature, the, we come to know that we are going to fall asleep and uh, we feel that modes are acting on us, on me. So Krishna says if someone engages, then he uh, immediately rises above the modes of material nature. So we come to know but how to resist that and how to... we are going to fall asleep. Well, you know you're going to fall asleep, you stand up. Or you open the window, or you sit up straight, you know you're going to fall. Why do you fall asleep? Because the back goes down, the back bends, the head down. <laughs> right, that's what happens. So you, you, you know you're going to fall asleep, and you know you don't need to sleep, you know you should be awake, you're supposed to be chanting japa. So stand up, open the window, let some air in. Go for a walk, you know, you don't, you, we don't, we're thinking we need to sleep, but actually often we don't. So we were talking about the Goswamis, they conquered over eating and sleeping. It's difficult sometimes, it's di you know, if I don't get six hours, then it's, it becomes difficult. I usually need six hours rest a night. But some nights, some nights it's just difficult, there's just so, so some maybe things happen in the day, so many things, and then and just in the, can't, can't sleep because it's so, so many things, problems or issues which are there in the mind, it's difficult to sleep. And so sometimes the next day, you know, you didn't get much sleep and you feel tired. But still, you want to keep regulating, don't give in. <laughs> St try to stay awake and then that next night, the next night then you sleep <laughs> because you didn't sleep good the night before so the next night you'll be ready to sleep. So during the daytime try to avoid sleep, try to open the windows, let fresh air in, stand up, chant loudly, mm. drink some water, freshen you up, wash your face, <laughs> there's many things you can do, you don't want to sleep. Everything depends on the attitude, right? Do we want to sleep? Are we interested to be awake or are we interested to sleep? <laughs> it's up to us, we have that will, free will, what do you want? 
You want to be awake or do you want, just want to sleep? You want to sleep? Go upstairs to the ashram, go and sleep, you know? <laughs> but this is not the place to sleep. Sometimes devotees would argue with Prabhupada. You know, Prabhupada would say, don't sleep! Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I'm not sleeping, Prabhupada. <laughs> Prabhupada would say, if your eyes are closed and you're not moving, you must be asleep. <laughs> yes, Prabhupada. <laughs> Don't argue with Prabhupada. <laughs> That's the lesson. Okay, what was that question there, someone? Prabhu? Maharaj, uh, if some other outsiders are uh, insulting devotees, we are not, not master of anger. Can we fight with them? But what are they doing to devotees? They're in book distribution, they're insulting. We don't. Uh, they're uh, like uh, behind us, they're like insulting, you don't come here. Like. They're trying to disrupt your sales. When you try to sell a book, they will come and try to disrupt, tell the people not to buy the book, not to give you any money. Like that? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, this is difficult. Uh, <laughs> We have these problems much worse in the West, you see. In the West, you, but you have to be very careful. You can't really fight with people because then they can, give, they can go to policemen, they can get you in trouble. You can end up bringing the police and make a legal case against you and so on. So you have to be a little careful about it. So that's why sometimes have to go to different places, move around, don't want to be in the same place. But generally we want to be very careful about using violence to people. Because unless they physically attack us, you don't really have a proper basis to be violent. If somebody physically attacks you, then of course you can defend yourself. But just because they're coming and disrupting, you just have to tolerate them. Just go some other place. We always have these things everywhere in the world. You have to be tolerant, move around, go different places. And these people also, they get fed up after a while. If they see that you're not disturbed, then <laughs> they'll feel discouraged. But if they see that they're disturbing you, then they get more encouraged to, to be there. They're, they're taking more pleasure in disturbing you. So try to be tolerant. It's sometimes good if there's two of you there, then one of you can talk to the person <laughs> while the other person distributes the book. Yes, Prabhu? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, at the beginning you mentioned that the attitude is very important uh, in Krishna consciousness. So if you can explain more about what exactly attitude we should have dealing with the devotees serving in the temple and preaching? Well, the attitude should be that I am a, a fallen soul and I have come here to render service to Lord Krishna. Please engage me in your service. Right? We're chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. Please engage me in your service. So we should have that mood that I want to be the servant. I'm a fallen soul and I've come here to render service, to purify my consciousness. So please engage me in your service and help me to get purified. 
help me to get relief from my material attachment. That attitude should be there, that I'm unqualified, I have no qualification, I'm a fallen soul, I'm nobody, I'm insignificant, and I'm simply coming here, please tolerate me and give me a chance to become your devotee. Yes, yes Prabhu at the back. Maharaj, uh, the question that he wants to ask is, uh, he wants to understand how you used to distribute books, what you used to tell to people during your times. When we distribute books? Yeah. Well, we tell them that this is a book written by my teacher. My teacher is a guru from India. And he's explaining the knowledge of yoga. He's teaching us how to control the mind, how to find happiness within, how to find the real self, happiness within. You should read this book and be benefited. It can change your life. And if you don't want to change your life, that's okay, but it can make you happier. And this book, you can keep it with you, you can read it again and again. It's not just book for one time reading, you can read it again, over and over again. Every time you read it, you'll get something new, you'll learn something more. It's spiritual. Very, it's not like the newspaper, you read it one time and you throw it away, useless. But you read this book, you read it again and again, and the more you read them, the more you get benefit. Spiritual knowledge. So take one book. Take many books, why one book? Get a whole set. Yes? yes? Maharaj, you told that ignorance is the root cause of sinful desires. But we have seen that many times in knowledge also, some people commit sinful things. People know that the drugs and intoxicants are not good for health. But they also do sinful activities, sinful desires they have. So how is the ignorance is the root cause of sinful Well, they have desires for sinful things because of ignorance. That's their ignorance. Their desire for sinful things is ignorance. Their desire for intoxication or for meat eating and these things, this is their ignorance. They're thinking these things are going to give enjoyment, but that's ignorance. These activities are just going to bring them suffering. They're going to bring them misery. They're going to go the cause of their distress. Sometimes they know that they Sometimes they know that these things will give them misery, but due to uncontrolled mind they commit. Yes, that's right. Uncontrolled mind, that's the problem, their uncontrolled mind. So we're telling them you have to learn how to control the mind. When you learn how to control the mind, then you won't want to do these things. Because they don't control the mind, they're doing these sinful activities. When they learn how to discipline the mind and make the mind a friend, then they will learn to give up these activities which are causing them trouble. They have to learn what activities to do. You give up the useless activities, the nonsense, and take up the sensible activities, do the good things. Give up the bad things, give up the intoxication and simply hear and chant about Krishna. And that's the intoxication, spiritual intoxication. Be intoxicated in love of God. You want intoxication? Krishna Prem, that is that's the highest intoxication. So, 
learn how to enjoy actual pleasure, the higher, the real pleasure. We don't say no pleasure, everyone wants to enjoy, we want some pleasure. So the higher pleasure, the highest, the highest level, by practicing religious principles. You want to enjoy a relationship with the opposite sex, get married. Get married and have a family. That is, that is not, this, that, is the, that is a very pure thing. Somebody asked me the other day, I was giving class, it was to China, and one, one young girl, she was not married, and she was saying that, isn't it that when people have sex, it's just a dirty thing? So I said, well, no, I said, it's the highest thing, it's the most pure thing, if it's done according to religious principles. Because Krishna says, Dharma Varude Bhuteshu Kamosmi Bharatarsama. Krishna said, I am that action which is not against religious principles. So when you perform the act of sex according to religious principles, Krishna becomes that action. So it's a very pure activity. It's a very sacred activity. Because the purpose of the couple is to produce a God-conscious child. And they want to produce a child who will not take birth again in the material world. Or they want to produce a child who's an incarnation of God, even. So that's a very pure thing. They have to be very pure souls. So we have to understand these things properly. We don't say no sex, but we say no illicit sex. Bhaktivinoda Thakur had 11 children. Prabhupada had five children. Do you think they were having illicit sex? No. Gorgovinda Maharaj said, I think he had how many children? I can't know. Huh? Seven, right? I thought seven. I said he had sex with his wife seven times. Every time he had sex, she conceived a child. That is real brahmacharya. So we have to understand these things properly. Sometimes, you know, we're thinking, oh, Maya, he fell down. <laughs> we don't understand. What is, what is Krishna saying? Krishna saying, I am those activities which are not against religious principles. Krishna himself becomes that act of conceiving a child. So it's very pure when it's done properly. But for people who are uncontrolled, of course it's sinful degree. So we have to learn how to do everything in Krishna consciousness. So we don't say don't eat. We say eat Krishna prasada. Don't say don't eat. Eating prasadam, purifying, very great. Yes, Prabhu has a question at the back. Yeah. Uh, Maharaj is asking how much prasad should uh, one take. Well, Ayurveda say that things like uh, they. Sh they should put twenty uh, one third water, one third air, one third food. You should take water before the meal. And wa uh, water you can take some during the meal, but not after the meal. Water after the meal will put out the fire of digestion. And we shouldn't just eat food and fill the belly with solid food. You should drink water first and put some water in the belly and then you eat. And then you have to leave air, the room for air also. If you just fill the belly with food, no air, then also not right. That's what the Ayurveda says.
Some people need to eat more, other pe some people can eat less. It will be different for different people. Some people can eat like the bird. <laughs> little bit, little bit, you know, madhukari. Some people need to eat more. Some people doing a lot of physical service, they will need more. Especially if you're going for book distribution, then you need more. You need to have energy. You should eat more, prasana. Okay, any other question? Okay, then we'll stop here today. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.